We are back in Santa Monica with Ask the Doc. Doc, good to see you, my friend. Nice to have you back in town, Dave. <laughs> it's been too long. Yeah. We're back. We got some questions from the fans. You ready to roll? Yep. First right. question is uh, says, "Hey, thanks for your time. Our pleasure." My question is, what dangers, if any, are there associated with high DHEA sulfate levels in the blood as a result of TRT therapy? Um, and any suggestions to mitigate mitigate those issues? So I've seen this occasionally. Um, the first thing I ask patients is, you know, what are you taking? Because sometimes these supplements, um, we all know that the, the, the industry is regulated, but it's just not enforced real well. <clears throat> sometimes these supplements have DHEA in them, and there's three metabolites of DHEA, uh, one of which typically doesn't show up on assays. I don't know if it's just too expensive. I never asked to get a, a seven keto DHEA assay, but typically, um, um, the assays that you can get uh, pretty ubiquitously at the doctor's office, you know, they'll include a serum DHEA and a, uh, a sulfate of DHEA, DHEA sulfate. And what I found is DHEA sulfate tends to be the more stable number. And uh, so the body likes to store it in a sulfated form. Um, so it'd be nice to know what the number is, the assay for just DHEA serum to see if it it jibes, and I, and I typically get those two together to see what's going on. I mean, you know, I have my own process of trying to balance in my head what what is the right uh, amount. Um, and honestly, uh, while while I'm going off on this long tangent, what is the right amount? I'll ask a patient: um, Are you suffering from frequent colds and infections? Um, a lot of inflammation, achy joints, um, and if not, then I don't pay much attention or as much attention to what would be considered lower than average levels of DHA and DHA sulfate. But yeah, my first question would be, you know, are you slipping in some extra DHA inadvertently through some of the supplements? My second one is just a comment that, yeah, oftentimes, especially early on in, in therapy, especially if you've been depending upon the mechanism by which we can adjust for a lack of testosterone. So, you know, the cool thing is, one cool thing is the body will make more receptors, uh, more, more uh, locks for the same number of keys, keys being, you know, in this analogy, the, the testosterone. So that's the first thing, but if you're short in testosterone, body can make, well, first, you know, you, hopefully your, your pituitary will, will send a signal to the testicles to make more, or in the case of a female, uh, the ovaries, but, um, if that doesn't work out, then the body upregulates the number of receptors. It also has another mechanism by which the adrenals will re release DHEA, and DHEA can be converted down the line, as they say in that cascade of hormones, starts with cholesterol, then goes to, in broad categories, pregnenolone, DHEA, progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. So uh, early on, you know, perhaps the body just hasn't adjusted yet and realized, hey, we got plenty of this and, and you can see some, some levels um, that are higher than usual. And I don't know when, when this, uh, it doesn't say if this is a male or a female. Male, yeah, I think so. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what the levels were when it's high. Is it just outside the, the, the reference interval? which I don't know where they come up with some of these reference intervals, but uh, DHA, from what I've seen in most laboratory assays, the reference interval is pretty reasonable. Not so for something like LDL. That's nothing close to normal, certainly, what I see. But uh, um, I was going to say, in, in females, typically, we'll see this more often than in males because it looks like, in my experience, females tend to depend upon that backup system a little bit more so than guys do. So that might be what it is, and, and you know, there's all other issues to just throw in there since we're considering different things. Laboratory error, uh, assay to assay fluctuations. I'll see this, and it turns out, you know, in four consecutive blood draws, it was just an, uh, you know, an aberrant number. The rest of them were all well within normal limits, but this one's a high one. So I wouldn't necessarily um, do it. Well, I wouldn't do anything, really, except check to make sure I'm not taking any supplemental DHEA I didn't realize I was taking um, and just see what the next uh, assay brings it, it, you know, so do we necessarily need to mitigate this issue not necessarily one thing that I will throw in here too since I'm going off on tangents is 
my preferred form of supplementing, if someone needs supplemental DHA, is 7-keto DHA because it won't directly convert to another hormone that we don't necessarily want. The problem is, we, like I said, I, I've never seen uh, the assay on like a LabCorp list or a Quest list. Uh, I'm assuming it's either hard or too expensive to test for, but the studies will show typically that 100 milligrams to 200 milligrams preferably divided you know, twice a day for a female will get to adequate levels uh, or optimum, I guess I should say. And for males, 200 to 400 milligrams of seven keto DHA as a supplement. Again, without the assay, we can't really determine what's going on and, and, and it won't show up as DHA sulfate or DHA serum. So it's one of those where you just kind of have to guess, but there's an advantage to it obviously. And, you know, some studies show there's some uh, thermogenic capacity to 7-keto DHA for those that want to try and burn off a little extra fat. But um, anyway, um, the, the only thing I can think of is, you know, and there's a presumption here that's a result of TRT therapy is, again, you're, you're, uh, I think the term they used to use was, you know, the hormones are getting backfilled as a result uh, early on in TRT therapy. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. All right, Doc. So another question, hey doc, I am 19 years old and have been training for around 45 years. I'm looking into taking some form of, and I'm not sure if this was a uh, typo, uh, yeah, type of, some, some form of drama. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> we try to stay away from that. <laughs> yeah, we try to stay away from the drama. Uh, some form of, I, I think he says, might be saying drug or some kind of androgenic help to put on muscle mass. What is the best idea for this, and what is the safest and most mild SARM that can stack on some mass? I'm also trying to firmly steer clear of as many side effects as possible. Thanks. I'm going to assume this is a male too. Yeah. No, I don't have a name, and, and, and anyway, but uh, yeah, for the most part, those are the guys that are <laughs> trying to put on muscle mass, yeah. not necessarily a female, but it could be. And SARMs typically are not taken by females for good reason. So a couple things here, and, and please don't shoot the messenger. Um, you're asking me and I'm just gonna answer. Yeah. 19 years old, um, great that you're training for four to five years, keep training. Uh, at 19, um, you know, you're still forming the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. And while we now believe it's more soft wired than hard wired, um, you want that to be established and, you know, last, study or textbook I read that occurs somewhere around 26 years old so to start messing around prematurely previous to that 26 year old uh, mark you're, you're rolling the dice have I seen it uh, ruin that HPA axis formation uh, not that often but could happen it could happen and I have seen it happen okay uh, so you're rolling the dice there I am not a big fan of SARMs. I think I've said that many times yeah. before, simply because they they have similar or sometimes worse side effects with fewer uh, benefits. benefits. People don't agree with you on that. I mean, the viewers and uh, you know you you know you're from, you, you know you have a training in medicine and everything, but people are so hell bent that it's so much better and that it's there's no side effect and that's what's out there. Well, I have to I have to plead some uh, ignorance too because yeah, like you say, it's it's not in my practice. Mm -hmm. a, a while ago, probably <laughs> probably a decade now, when Austrian came out, uh, a practitioner and I uh, jumped on board. We were um, you know, sponsored by the manufacturer of the Austrian, and we had uh, patients who were willing to take it. A lot of athletes, including bicycle riders. Okay. And what we noticed, and the the dosage was twenty five milligrams. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second because that's that could be part of the argument. You know, well, you only did 25. You need to do 75. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I, I plead ignorance. But in that study, uh, we saw um, a lot of abnormalities, none of which I necessarily care about. You know, I, I tell me if you don't want me to go off on too far no, a tangent go, with, go, with because, the lipids again. But yeah, yeah. you know, seeing the HDL drop doesn't scare me um, because it's short term. It's going to bounce back. And as we know now, even though it's not propagated in the media that much, even amongst doctors, it's not LDL that's causing coronary artery disease. It's not making the plaque build up. Unless you have extant coronary artery disease, then it'll help further it. Just like 
No, uh, gasoline around a spark will, will cause a problem, but the gasoline itself doesn't cause a problem. So having low HDL, the so-called good cholesterol, and high uh, LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, is not necessarily a bad thing. If that were the case, for, for, uh, by the way, uh, and I think I've said this before, all these people who are on ketogenic diets in this country who are you know, consuming a large, large amount of saturated fats and have LDLs close to 200, okay, would be dropping dead, yeah. okay? It's typically a very long-term process anyway. So would you be rolling the dice somewhat if you did have unknown, it hadn't been established as, but you had it, you just didn't know it, coronary artery disease? Well, yeah, for the period that you're on it, three months or whatever, you would be furthering the formation of plaque. Uh, but that goes for anything. I mean, you should know what you get into. So find out if you have plaque before you do anything, including anabolic steroids, which have the same side effect profile where every anabolic steroid is going to have uh, an issue reducing the good cholesterol, the HDL, and increasing the, the bad cholesterol, as they say, the, the LDL. Um, but again, uh, since in my experience, anabolic steroids have a, a much better benefit profile, why would I want to go to a SARM? Now, I've conjectured that, you know, especially being a registered libertarian, you know, people don't want to have to go to a doctor. They like the freedom of, hey, I'm getting this on my own and yeah. I'm, I can, you know, chastise by a physician or whatever. I, I get that part of it. And that's, in my opinion, been a lot of the drive behind the SARMs. Now, that said, first of all, there are a lot of new SARMs, I think, partly to uh, to justify the reaction. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I, and, and, you know, not that I'm having a reaction, but uh, to, to, to uh, um, you know, respond to... Uh, uh, you know the 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 voice of the the, the bodybuilders who are using it, right? Or not doesn't have to be bodybuilders necessarily, but uh, there are so many new SARMs coming out that maybe uh, you know Osterine was one of the first ones. Maybe there are a lot more that have more benefit with the same uh, side effect profile. Remember, they're still oral, and uh, without the testing that I haven't seen any uh, about the ones I know about, you know, the rad 140s and mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a slew of new ones, just like there's a whole bunch of new peptides out there, mm -hmm. you know, for secretocogs and whatnot. Um, but maybe the dosage is an issue too. And you have to use triple what it says in the box and mm -hmm. I hate to go down there and do the yeah. old double the dose and hope for the most thing because that's, you know, again, so, so my reticence isn't necessarily, particularly nowadays that we don't have effective SARMs we don't have them tested. Yeah. So it's a roll of the dice. And I, and I know this area, the gym guys, okay, the athletes will say in a broader uh, stroke, are great sources of, of data um, the bro initially. Science. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, um, some of the rationales behind how something's working are sometimes just crazy, silly. But the results are the results. Um, and if you can tease out, you know, guys that stack something, in other words, you know, again, trying to get to the heart of the point of this, mm -hmm. um, you know, the gym or, or the athletic world is a place where a lot of these things, for better or for worse, get tested. And any athlete knows, hey, this works or it doesn't. I mean, guys my generation that were using anabolics a long time ago, um, you know, and listening to some of the, the propaganda, oh, that, those anabolic steroids don't do anything. Really? And how come I just increased my, my butt to the floor squats by a hundred pounds in, in, you know, one and a half months. Right. Uh, so again, I, I, all I can do, you know, to cut the chase here is I, I plead ignorance. Uh, uh, but you know, I also would like to say, you know, fair warning. I mean, let, you know, make sure as best you can at least monitor your blood work while you're doing this and help collect some of the data because we don't have it. You yeah. Know, we don't even have animal studies for some of these things. So. I get it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good point. All right. Thanks, Doc. Sure. All right, Doc. So this next question asks, uh, I recently saw questions answered regarding growth hormone and tendons, but I'm curious if there's any science promoting the use of growth hormone to treat cervical spine injuries. I was recently diagnosed with two herniated discs, C5, C6, and C6, C7, and cervical stenosis. I've found a bit of science, but it isn't peer-reviewed information. Thank you in advance for your time. Well, I can speak to this directly. Um, I, not that we need to hear about me, but I've had several spine surgeries and yeah, issues with herniated discs and all kinds of cervical stenosis. 
And the only thing that I can say is useful about growth hormone in recovery, and this is based upon uh, the science as well as you know, trying to promote growth hormone uh, you know, internally myself, is it helps with wound healing. Definitely helps with wound healing, and you'll you'll hear um, surgeons uh, who refer patients to, to us here at RSM say, "Hey, can you give them something, a secretagogue, to help them build growth hormone levels up to help them with surgery?" But if you talk to the neurosurgeons or the orthopedic surgeons who perform the surgery, they'll tell you it doesn't speed the recovery of, um, uh, like, say. Uh, I'm not talking about a laminectomy or something, but a replacement disc, okay, or a fusion. In, in that area, it doesn't speed anything up. Again, mm. and I, and I hope I'm not being confusing. There's a difference between the surgical wound where you had to cut through. Yes. Because the lumbar, you're spreading muscle. And the actual In the cervical, you're injury. cutting, yeah, much more. So that can heal faster with growth hormone. Okay. But, uh, you know, the bone healing and stuff, I think the best thing you can do is... Your vitamin D, you okay. know, ten thousand IU a day. Nice. You can maybe double up <clears throat> for that time period. Nice. Uh, most people <clears throat> are getting enough calcium, particularly those who are on TRT, by the way, because I think I've said this in the past. In my uh, what I've noticed in the study show, you're you're hoarding more calcium than most when you're on TRT or an anabolic. Um, so that's really the only thing you know you you should concentrate on. Although there's nothing wrong with speeding surgical wound healing. But for a fusion or a cervical uh, disc replacement, you're still going to be limited, uh, particularly with a fusion, by that time period of healing. So, you know, why spend the money? Why worry about surgical wound healing, which will happen a lot sooner? Okay. It's a good question, though. Yeah, yeah, no. I, but, but uh, yeah, I don't think you're going to see much on it. Partly because, in this country anyway, it's illegal to prescribe, except for seven different disease states, none of which involve this. You yeah. Know, so. Uh, I don't think you're going to find much uh, peer-reviewed information, but that's been my experience is that it helps with surgical wound healing. That's all you're going to get out of it. Awesome.